Thank you, Camilla. Um, it's a great honor to stand here. Um, I'm from the Dutch College of GPs and the Royal College of GPs. I consider that as our elderly brother with a lot of more wisdom, a lot of more experience. Uh, on the other hand, the Dutch College is 60 years old, so we also have a lot of wisdom. And I would like to get the opportunity to exchange our wisdom and experience with you. Um, I do not have uh, conflicts of interest, but I have a strong personal belief that happy GPs will do a better job than unhappy GPs. That's my personal interest. <laughs> Something more about my background. I'm a GP in the center of the Netherlands, a small town of 30,000 citizens. Um, this is my, a picture of my practice. It's a small business, small business model. Uh, on the days where I'm not in my practice, a young female colleague is taking uh, care of my patients. Uh, in the same building, a solo doctor is also having his practice and we together serve uh, the care for 5,500 patients. And my main job is that I'm heading the Department of Guideline Development and Research at the Dutch College of General Practitioners. And part of the job, uh, for one day a week, I hold an academic chair on the theme Promoting Personalized Care in Clinical Practice Guidelines. And if you remember the presentation of Helen on Thursday, she was also discussing this theme. We need the evidence, but we also need professionals who are tailoring the evidence and the knowledge on individual patients. And the talk of Helen was so inspiring. I think it was one of the best presentations I've heard in medicine. Thank you. Um, I'm also happy to be a Harkness Fellow, uh, similar as Martin Marshall. He was the first uh, UK Harkness Fellow. Uh, it, 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 may, it, makes, it will give you a more international perspective, and that is what I also have in my pocket, thanks to that. If we talk about happiness, we should define, we should start with a definition. And I've looked for several definitions, and I come, came up with this definition in philosophy, living a good life or flourishing. And this is a very uh, uh, commonly uh, citation of Aristotle. The only thing that humans desire for its own sake, unlike riches, honor, health, or friendship. So it's not the same, happiness is not the same as being rich or being honored or being health. Health can contribute, but it's not the same as happiness. It's something different. It's, it's something for yourself. But in philosophy, there's no consensus about definition. Look at this definition. Man does not strive for happiness, only the Englishman does. Nietzsche is, Nietzsche is from Germany, and maybe German, Germany is the only country which do not strive for happiness. I don't know. <laughs> so let's go to the psychology, psychological definition of happiness. A mental or emotional state of well-being. Um, you might argue whether the brain or the heart is dominating, and I feel more about the heart uh, part of well-being, but I think it, it's a combination. It's still a combination, but it's more in my, in my heart than in my head, I think. So if we um, um, go further with the definition, you, you can consider two kinds of happiness, and you have a, a definition of happiness which is false, and that's the, the addictions, the possessions and power. That's short-term happiness. That's not real happiness. It's more the kick. And, uh, but that will diminish very uh, soon. And the true and the real inner happiness is the spontaneous contentment that comes for good health, creative work, and loving relationships. And let's go to this citation of Goethe. He is happiest, be he king or peasant, who finds peace in his home. So it's something very close to yourself, to your home. And if we adapt this definition for general practitioners, you can say, well, be he king or general practitioner who finds peace in his medical home. So that's, if you are a happy GP, you find peace in doing your job at your own business. Okay, let's go. Um, I would like to know from you 
what you think uh, about your happiness. Uh, this is a question, it's slightly adapted because the question how satisfied are you with practicing medicine is very often used in surveys, but I changed it a bit. But you can consider happy and satisfaction as synonym. So if you go to your app and um, can we have this slide up? So you can vote now. If you go to your app and you can vote now. Okay, can we have the slider up now? We did a rehearsal <laughs> before the session. Okay. It's not here. It's okay. Um, that's quite good. On the other end, not all of you are happy. So I think st still things can improve. Okay. Uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's go to the next question. Did your happiness with practicing medicine change in the last three years? So did it improve? Is it about the same or has it worsened? So please go to the slider. Yeah, can you show me the results? Ah. Okay, so it has improved. That's, that's interesting. And um, we should ask a question before the conference and after the conference. <laughs> Maybe that's different. But, well, 30% it has been has worsened. So that's still a wake up call, I think. Okay. And then the final question I would like to ask you. Considering the Dutch colleagues, do you think that your happiness compared to Dutch colleagues are better, about the same, or worse? <laughs> okay, let me show the results. <laughs> well, so the question of uh, the theme of this presentation is, are Dutch, hap Dutch GPs happier? Well, the majority are, so, okay. I hope that I can cheer you a bit up, because we also have problems, we also have issues, we also have debates uh, and struggling about things. So if you share the problems, share the big issues, then I hope you feel better. Okay, something about the primary care system in the Netherlands. We have 11,000 general practitioners, 7,900 practices. All of them has a practice assistant that's different from a receptionist. The practice assistant is also doing triage. So that means that, he, that she can filter the problems for the doctor. And she can also give telephone advice. So that's different from the UK. 90% uh, of the practice has a practice nurse who is taking care for the chronic patients, elderly patients. We're covering the whole population, just as in the UK, from the newborn babies to the elderly people. And the GP is, should mandatory offer after-hour service. So it's mandatory for all the practice owners. They, they, they should organize also and also participate in after-hour servicing. Um, there's a debate about that, whether we should continue with that, similar as in this country. Um, the GP visit is free, so no cost, uh, only for the additional testing and medication co-payment is needed, and that's raising. That's also an issue. Patients are complaining about that, and also the GPs. But the satisfaction with the GPs, we do uh, annual surveys among patients, is continuously high, eight on the scale from zero to ten. And I've heard also in this conference that the satisfaction of patients with UK colleagues are, is also very high. Okay, that's our good message. If you compare general practice in the UK with the Netherlands, we see a lot of similarities and a few differences. If you look at the income, it's almost the same. If you add up the uh, income of out of our care, then you see almost the same salaries and income 
uh, compared UK and the Netherlands. The workload is also almost the same, but the change in uh, consultation rate did increase. So there's a more demand on the GP. Um, I forgot to tell you that the change in incomes, yeah, that was fallen by the UK in, with 11%. And psychologically, that's very bad if your income is going down. And in the Netherlands, it got the same. We still want to have a, a small increase, but well, the problem in the Netherlands is not the income. Psychologically, it's, it's okay. And then the popularity of the job, that's also a very important difference. Uh, we do not have a shortage of trainees. We have an oversupply. And in the Netherlands, in the UK, it is a great problem, which will also increase the demand for those GPs who are practicing, particularly in the rural areas. But if you look at the figures, if you see that 1,200 applicants for 750 vacancies, that's left 450 applicants who would like to train, to be trained as a GP. And 45, one GP's vacancy in the UK. So I think that's the solution. <laughs> To, to be serious, I think that the, the that secretary should think about this. If you have a strong marketing policy in the Netherlands, because UK is a very nice country, it's a great country, and to have more trainees from the Netherlands, maybe uh, you can solve the problem a bit. Okay, we also have data from international service, from the Commonwealth Fund survey. Every three years, the primary care doctors are interviewed by telephone, um, comparing eight to 10 countries and almost 1,000 uh, uh, practitioners per country. It's a it's, it's very uh, interesting survey, and you can also uh, see the trends. And then the question, how satisfied are you with practicing medicine? I also asked you, you see that in the UK it is declining since 2012. Um, I'm very interested in the new data of 2018, but this is really uh, concerning. In the Netherlands, there's also a slow decline. How satisfied are you with income? I already told in the Netherlands, it's okay. In the UK, people are dissatisfied with income since 2012. How stressful is the job? This is really concerning. In the Netherlands, it's considered as quite stressful, but uh, a low percentage consider it as extremely or very stressful. And in the UK, more than 60% consider the job as extreme stressful. And if you look at the view on the healthcare system, you also see a dramatic decline of the confidence in the system of the UK colleagues. Uh, more than uh, uh, almost 80% thinks that major changes in the system are necessary. On the other hand, in the Netherlands, you, see, you also see a decline. And uh, it's relative, of course, because 50% is, is still okay with the system, but another 50% thinks that changes are needed. So this is a new development uh, in the Netherlands. Um, it's... Uh, so doctors within our, uh, uh, within our family of doctors, so not a national organization, a few doctors in the western part of the country, organized a movement. It must change. Have you ever heard about that in the Netherlands? No? Because I think UK need that. Yeah? It must change. And you do it different. It's a, it's, it's a matter of culture. But in the Netherlands, this was uh, happening. And the reason was... Uh, it was uh, two and a half years ago. The reason was that the Dutch GPs were not happy with laws and legislation that hinders collaboration. They were fed up with administrative burden, with the ticking box exercises, similar as in the UK, and with the system of control instead of trust. It's all the same as, as with your country. So we share this problem. 70% of the GPs in the Netherlands signed the manifesto, and that's very interesting. There was not a fight between the stakeholders. 
So it was not the government or the payers against the, the GPs. They all agreed that the system is not working well. So they, they collaborated. They set up working groups to tackle this problem. And then uh, you also see a global movement about this. Uh, I remind you to the publication of Don Burbick of the IHI, you all know them. And he talked about the three eras. The first era of professional autonomy that uh, end, ends in the early 90s when the evidence-based medicine movement came up. The era, the era of professional autonomy means that the doctor knows well for your patient and does not need to account for that. But with the uh, movement of evidence-based medicine, you get more uh, uh, the need for transparency, more uh, accountability, and then there is an overshoot in that we also make guidelines, indicators, and external partners are misusing that. So that's, the, that's why we need the third era, the moral era. I will not go into detail in all the recommendations of Berwick, but you see a lot of similarities with your country and our country. And if we uh, consider the metaphor of uh, era one is, is the silence dominates, in era two it's a lot of noise which is dominating, and I hope in era three it's the music that will dominate. Preliminary, preliminary results of the It Must Change movement are presented here. So we have a good result at the moment uh, on the theme collaboration, 11 agreements, so not an annual contract, but a two-year contract, more play, flexible uh, negotiation options, more dialogue between the payers and the GPs. Administrative burden has been reduced, 16 agreements, less burden with drug prescribing, referrals, process of declaration and digital contracting, and the quality system, that was the most toughest part, and that's still in progress, but we already agreed about having less performance indicators, a maximum of eight with uh, uh, every uh, chronic condition. Uh, we also want to improve and to stimulate audit and feedback using patient surveys, so we still think that you need to account for what you are doing. Uh, so we, we are not closing the doors of the consultation room, we still want to open it, but on a, in a level that we are uh, okay with that. Okay, so that's, that was the national movement, and the national movement uh, was a wake-up call. So if you remind the, the triple aim of Don Berwick, uh, the triple aim of Don Berwick is saying that you want to improve the, the health population, that you want to, improve the, uh, to, to want to reduce the cost, and that you want to improve patient experience. That's the triple aim. And this movement and also this conference and all the debates about burnout and about our workload, you can add a fourth aim. That is improving the doctor's experience, improving the, 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 the satisfaction of doctors with the job. Because what I said, happy doctors will do a better job than unhappy doctors. So how should we manage that, that we do not get burned out? And we can organize it on a national level. You can also do it on an individual level. But I will show you some, some recommendations on the national level. Start with supporting your national organization. The Royal College is the big family of UK doctors in UK, as our college is in the Netherlands. More than 90% of the GPs are a member of our college. We organize annual conferences, which can be considered as an annual vaccination. Then you get new inspiration, new, new energy, new spirit. It's a protection against burnout. So support your national organization. Lobby, in the positive terms uh, in, uh, of the word, lobby for governmental support. And I see you do. You have a dialogue with the NHS. You have a dialogue with the, with the secretary. So I think that's okay. Continue with that. So they should be also owner of the problem, of course. Monitor the workload, collect data about the workload. So do surveys among the doctors so that you can show what is happening. And negotiate, value for money. Yeah? So uh, try to do the best for your job. But be reasonable. And this is a, maybe a tricky one. Uh, you, with the introduction of the QOF, the quality outcome framework, the income was raising a lot. So lots of GPs were happy with their raise. But now you see the decline. It's smaller than the increase, I think. And psychologically, yeah, that's bad. So if you negotiate, 
try to be reasonable. Do not ex uh, focus too much on the income. Focus on job satisfaction as a proxy for quality. That's the message. Promote ownership of guidelines. You still need guidelines. You still need the evidence because we are professionals. We are academic professionals. We still need quality measure tools for measuring what we are doing. We are interested in our, our figures. We want to have feedback. We would like to continue that. But we, we should own that. It's not another organization which is doing that. Nice guidelines are very, very good. We also use nice guidelines, but it's very important that GPs are involved in that, so that you consider the nice guidelines also as, as part of their own. Collaborate between medical schools and training facilities. In the Netherlands, we have eight fa uh, faculties which have a very close collaboration, so the quality of the training is very good all over the country. So that's why um, the GP, uh, do, uh, that why, that's why students also, also like to become a GP, because the training is very good. And then offer free access for trainees to the GP congresses. That will help, that will also uh, uh, have the young colleagues here, and I think also a, 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 a Dutch uh, uh, delegation is also here. Well, yeah, hello. <laughs> So, in sum, can other countries learn from Dutch primary care? Yes, they can. Here are the key factors for success. The national governments should support primary health care. There should be a strong, well-accepted national professional organization like the college. Payment systems should support primary care, coordination of care, and additional services. A long-standing evidence-based guideline program we have in the Netherlands, a very long-standing guideline program, is also a key factor for success. And promoting collaboration and local peer support on the local level. Not competing, collaborating. And this is also recognized over the ocean by uh, Thomas Lee and Marit Tanke, that's a Dutch Harkness Fellow recently. And they said you need, need to use the social capital in healthcare, the ability to collaborate, trust, and adopt shared norms. That's very important. To come back to happiness, we have false happiness. So it's not, you cannot be happy if, 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 if. You should be happy from yourself. So if you want to change things, yeah, you should be happy. Then things will change. So it's not, you should not be dependent of the change. You, you sh should feel confident of yourself, and then things will change. I hope this con conference will uh, contribute to that. And finally, the best way to cheer up is to try to cheer somebody, somebody else up. Thank you very much. <laughs>